I'd like for the next 15 or 20 minutes to discuss the new perspectives of Paul, Israel, and the Palestinians. There's been a checkered history within Christianity of anti-Semitism. Uh, the early Christian-Jewish relationships were tried. They were tight at times and difficult. There's also the Holocaust in which millions of Jews were killed. And so post-Holocaust thinking from Christians in regarding uh, the Jews is a, is a fascinating one. And certainly in the last couple of decades, there's been the emergence of different uh, theologians and exegetes which have tried to grapple with the relationship of Christianity to Judaism. Uh, in discussing the new perspectives of Paul, Israel, and the Palestinians, one direction I don't want to go, which has often been emphasized in regards to Christians and Jews, Judaism, and the state of Israel, is the Christian Zionist movement, in which we see people like um, Jerry Falwell, Hagee from Christians United for Israel, which draw from a perspective of the Bible, the Jews are chosen people, the return of the Jews to Israel is a part of the fulfillment of prophecy, therefore to critique the Jews is to critique God because of their, his chosen people. Part of this comes out of a dispensational read of the Bible from Schofield, his first edition in 1909, and later editions of dispensationalism. And that's often has dominated certain forms of Christianity, of the Christian right, and Bible schools have drawn from this. But if we can see that as the cruder version of support of the state of Israel, there's a much more sophisticated read of this, and this is what I want to talk about. And, the new perspectives of Paul. I should also mention, on the other hand, that not every um, exegete which is engaging the book of Romans and the book of Galatians, which are really the key books in the new perspectives of Paul, agree with the new perspectives of Paul tradition. So there's quite a, a difference in terms of how we deal with that. The New Perspectives of Paul comes from a, per, a particular background in interpreting Romans, which is seen as St. Paul's magnus opus, and Galatians, which in one sense is the Reader's Digest version of uh, Romans, or some see uh, Romans for dummies. Galatians, it's a much more compressed, compact version of St. Paul's arguments. Uh, New Perspectives of Paul, the traditional establishment position has gone this way, essentially, using Paul's argument in Romans in Galatians. There is law in which when people try and fulfill the demands of law they can't and in their failing they then gaze up to the grace of God and God's mercy who redeems them. And so you have this contrast between law and grace or liberty on the one hand and bondage on the other or sovereignty, election, mercy and the works of humans trying to achieve, fulfill uh, God's desires, and hence pleasing God. So you have this dualism built into how you read Paul. And so with this notion of grace on the one hand, um, God's goodness, and you have law, which is seen as negative. So you've got a positive and you've got a negative. The one is seen as uh, the position which is problematic, the other is what releases you from the bondage of the problem. And so the whole issue of the justification by grace through faith, as articulated by Paul, or particularly interpreted by Paul, through Luther and Calvin, and many evangelicals come from the Calvinist Lutheran tradition, in some ways of interpreting Augustine, is the establishment uh, Sanhedrin position on how you read St. Paul. So we've got the evangelicals, many of them draw from Calvin, you've got Luther, a certain read of Augustine, and they're all turning to St. Paul's approach in Romans and Galatians of this particular understanding of grace, law, liberty, bondage, sovereignty, election, works. And so this, is, this has been the historic view of many within the Church of the West certainly dominating significant elements of the Protestant tradition, and it can be found within the Roman Catholic heritage as well, not so much within the Orthodox position. And many who have grown up then in the West inevitably absorb either in the religious upbringing, in the congregations, churches, parishes, they may attend this particular perspective. Now, New Perspectives of Paul has come along in the 1970s, uh, and challenged this particular read of St. Paul in Romans and Galatians. 
with an alternate uh, approach. Can we reduce St. Paul's arguments in Romans and Galatians, and other works, epistles for that matter, to this simple formula uh, uh, in terms of interpreting Paul's readings and hence its implications for Christian faith and, and the faith journey? Well, there has been two movements coming out of the new perspectives of Paul. Most are aware of the tradition coming out of E.P. Sanders, James Dunn, and N.T. Wright, and I'm going to touch on that particular view. But there was also a perspective which emerged earlier. To be slightly autobiographical here, I've been, uh, when I was doing my graduate studies of University of British Columbia and then McMaster University where I did my doctoral studies, these were two great hubs in Canada, and for that matter, North America, of intertestamental studies between Christianity uh, and Judaism. Actually, McMaster was funded in the millions when I was there in terms of uh, intertestamental studies, both um, Second Temple Judaism and then the relationship of Judaism to Christianity in post-Holocaust world. So we had some of the top scholars grappling with uh, Christianity, Jewishness, Judaism, and Israel at the time, and they were back and forth to Oxford and other universities around the world. Uh, two works were published in the 1970s, which shattered the understanding of the establishment Sanhedrin tradition on Romans, Galatians, and other writings of Paul. One was Christa Stendhal, published in 1977, a book, and this is when I was just uh, emerging and trying to think through some of these issues. He looked at Paul in relationship to the Jews and Gentiles, and he moved the discussion of the Lutheran, Calvinist, Evangelical, Augustine read of Paul. Remember, Stendhal is coming out of post-World War II uh, Holocaust background, and the Holocaust forced many thoughtful and sensitive theologians and exegetes to grapple with what is the relationship of Christianity to Judaism, given the history of anti-Semitism and given the Holocaust. Is there other ways of reading the Bible, and how should Christians grapple with this? Um, and Christer Stendel was one of the key figures. He turned to Romans 9-11, became uh, central for his, his work on these issues. And he argued, let's move the discussion away from justification by grace through faith. Uh, some of the issues I've mentioned earlier in terms of grace and law, liberty and bondage. He said Paul was, this was, yes, this was of interest to him, but far more important to St. Paul's writings was his relationship to the Jews. And the argument Stendhal was making, Paul Van Buren is going to follow Stendhal on this, and see, this is where you were getting a much more political read in terms of the new perspectives of Paul. When we get to Sanders, Dunn, and Wright, uh, we're going to look at a little bit of the political, but we're also going to look at the whole grace law thing also. But for Stendhal and Paul Van Buren, they're going to politicize the new perspectives of Paul issue. In one sense, they're before the um, E.P. Sanders, James Dunn, and N.T. Wright. So what Stendhal and Buren are going to argue, as I mentioned earlier, remember this is post-Holocaust, you have to be sensitive, you have to be tender to the Jewish story, uh, to the history of Christianity and, and Judaism. So uh, Stendhal is going to argue at the heart of Romans is not only the argument of justification by grace through faith, but in fact Paul is arguing he comes obviously from a Jewish background, that's his roots, he's a Pharisee trained under Gamaliel, um, that the Jewish tradition with its calling by God and the covenant does continue. And in that sense, uh, with the coming to be of Christianity, it has not superseded or replaced the important role of God's election and choice for the Jews. And so in that sense, there is almost a two covenant position going on. And Paul's argument in 9 to 11, he argues all the Jews will be saved. So the Jewish story continues in that sense. Okay, now the interesting thing about Paul in 9 to 11, Paul is not talking about land though, okay? So what Paul's arguing is an exegetical theolo theological position in terms of the relationship of the ongoing story of the Jews, even though Christianity has come and replaced or superseded Judaism. Stendhal is going to argue that's not the case, okay? Paul is, Paul's position is that yes, the Jewish story, or the Christian story, the church grows out, of the Jewish womb, as it were, but 
the Jews still remain close to the heart of God and they have not been uh, rejected. Paul's argument, of course, of the olive tree, the branch being cut off, the new branch being put on, but the trunk, the roots, the sap are still Jewish in that sense. So Christianity should never, in that sense, see themselves as superseding or replacing the Jewish story. Now what Christian Stendel does in Paul Van Buren, which is very interesting, is their argument is at a theological exegetical level, okay, the Jewish tradition continues following Paul's argument 9 to 11, but there's more to the story than this. The return of the Jews, going back to the 19th century, through the 20th, the founding of the State of Israel in 1948. Uh, this is part of God's fulfilling um, the promises to the Jews. And so Christer Stendel and Paul Van Buren, who wrote a great work, came out in 1980, Stendel's came out in 77, became great supporters, not only of Christian Jewish dialogue, not only of two different traditions of God's calling to people, but in fact, they became central Christians in terms of supporting the state of Israel and they connected with the Rabbi Hartman and the Shalom Hartman Institute in Israel was a significant institute in terms of uh, Christian Jewish studies. It's fascinating when violence erupted at times uh, as it did often in Israel amongst the Palestinians and the Jews. One of uh, Hartman's statements when there had been some suicide bombers in 202, he says, wipe out the Palestinians. And this for Stendhal and Van Buren, of course, was a wake-up call of sorts. Uh, but of course they could have, if they were attuned to what was happening, have, have seen what was going on there very clear before that. But it's fascinating, their particular read of Christer Stendhal and Paul Van Buren blinded them to the oppression and marginalization of the Palestinians. And interesting enough, Stendhal was a, a Lutheran, taught at Harvard, he became a bishop in Sweden. And so uh, there were a variety of Lutheran Palestinians in the area. He met those Lutheran Palestinians, but his, his uh, approach to reading Paul, his application of it, blinded him uh, to, in fact, the in-the-trenches, on-the-ground reality of Palestinian Lutherans. And so it really wasn't until Hartman's statement of White the Mountain 202, he tentatively and timidly contacted Hartman, and Hartman never responded to him. But they had a decades-long friendship. Hartman is a rabbi, and then Stendhal is a theologian. And so when we think of the new perspectives of Paul, the first thing to note is, one, the critique of the establishment Sanhedrin position, which I might add is, is very much in vogue today through the neo-Calvinists of the Christian coalition, uh, Piper, Keller, and Carson has been a key figure in critiquing, critiquing the new perspectives of Paul pers perspective. And um, I would say J.I. Packer, two books have just come out by Packer, and the younger, some of the younger people within the Gospel Coalition are real keeners on Packer and supporting these books. They've done interviews on these books. So the, you have the establishment Sanhedrin in terms of how you read uh, how you read Paul in Romans and Galatians. You then have the Neo-Calvinists of the Gospel Coalition, Packer being the elder, Keller, Piper, Carson, and then you have a new generation which are coming along, which when they don't accept the new perspectives of Paul and are continuing that Sanhedrin tradition. Now the second movement within the new perspectives of Paul, so I've talked about the one which is a very politicized view and which is actually pro-Zionist. It leads to support of the state of Israel. And there has been many people within the mainstream church tradition which have taken this position largely influenced by a revisionist read of Paul. So when we think of new perspectives of Paul, people often ignore the Christer Stenball, Paul Van Buren tradition and where it leads to in terms of silence, in terms of the treatment of the Palestinians, an uncritical attachment to the state of Israel that not only comes from a sort of guilt from the Holocaust, but also a reading of the Bible. And if people see the Bible as the authority um, and they see a misread of the Bible via uh, the traditional read, and this is the new read, then if the Bible is a source of authority, uh, Stendhal, Van Buren are key figures, then we must support the Jews. Judaism, Israel. The second approach, which is not as politicized as the Christer Stendhal, Paul Van Buren approach in terms of the new perspectives of Paul, is the tradition which emerged through E.P. Sanders, 
James Dunn and N.T. Wright. Fascinating that uh, E.P. Sanders, when I was doing my doctoral studies in McMaster, E.P. Sanders was there at the time and the New Perspectives of Paul was front and center. And his book came out, his first book came out uh, in 1977, which dealt with these issues the same year Christopher Stensdale did. So we had two, two traditions of the New Perspectives emerging. Paul, one a highly politicized, very pro-Israeli uh, drift and direction that Van, uh, Stendhal and Van Byrne were going. You then have the uh, Sanders, Dunn, and N.T. Wright tradition. I just want to look at some of the differences going on there. E.P. Sanders was not as concerned as Stendhal was with the Jews, Judaism, and the application of that for the contemporary state of Israel and the Palestinians. He was much more the academic, which was looking at the issues of Paul and the law and Second Temple, Jerusalem. And the question Sanders raised in the late 70s and then throughout the 80s, which established him as the point person in terms of this new perspectives of Paul, was why did Paul in Romans and Galatians seem to have such a negative view of the law. And why did he oppose grace and law in that sense? Liberty and bondage, sovereignty, election, and works. Because in Second Temple Judaism, in all the literature at this period of time, between the end of the Apocrypha and the coming to be of Christianity, the Jews had a very high view of the law. Okay, You can see that even in Psalm 1. Psalm 119. So this negative view of the law, where did it even come from? These were the questions Sanders asked. So not only in the biblical phase, you don't find this negative view of the law. In the intertestamental or second temple phase, you don't have this negative view of the law. So what is Paul reacting to in terms of this almost demonizing of the law. People can't fulfill all the requirements of, of, of the law. Then they're guilty before God, and Christ has to come um, to, accept the, uh, to accept them, be his sacrifice on the cross as, as the lamb. Then God tends to see humans through Christ's sacrifice. Well, Sanders argues that what Paul is reacting to is not particularly the law in its better sense, but the law as it came to be understood in terms of Sabbath requirements, circumcision, temple worship, uh, foods, kosher foods, and then there was a whole list of requirements that were expected by many Jews in Paul's time. And so these were, this was not the essence of the law. This was more a peripheral understanding of the law. But why did Paul emphasize this very secondary element of the law when the core of the law, most Jews still held on to and were central to their thinking. And so this became the essence of the new perspectives of Paul, a total rethinking, a total rethinking of the negative view of the law, seeing it more positive. And why did Paul have to go down this route, have to go down this route in Romans and Galatians, and hence birthing a certain understanding of Christianity, which many which many sort of Jews would never have thought at um, in that perspective at the time. Uh, and so what you get in Sanders' thinking, he doesn't politicize this. Unlike Stendhal and Van Buren, they're very interested in terms of rereading Romans and Galatians in terms of an attitude towards the Jews, Judaism, and contemporary Jewishness in the state of Israel. That's a highly politicized read of the new perspectives of Paul. Sanders is taking a much more academic approach, getting back to Second Temple Judaism and trying to understand why Paul took the position he did when most Jews at the time did not take that position. Pharisees, Jews, Zealots, Essenes, any of these people. Um, what's, what's going on there? So in E.P. Sanders, what you have a sense is the academic, just staying with the questions of Paul, law, uh, doing a rethink of Paul's reasons for seeing the law in this way. Um, but he does not deal with the contemporary issues of either Jews, Judaism, secular or religious in contemporary Israel. There's relative silence in that new perspective of Paul. James Dunn is much more willing to go in that direction, but certainly not in the public way. I've had various emails with James Dunn over the years. 
and he's quite willing to argue, okay, let's do the revisionist read of Paul, rethink all this, but he privately certainly has his concerns in terms of the state of Israel and the Palestinians, West Bank, Gaza, uh, refugee camps, situation like this. And so Dunn, on the one hand, stays within that academic world of reflecting on a certain Pauline understanding of the law. Uh, and privately, he's concerned with, obviously, where some of this can lead when applied in terms of contemporary situations. N.T. Wright is the third in this trilogy of Sanders, uh, Dunn, and Wright. And he, um, he argues, and this is where uh, Wright has come into conflict with many of those who will argue, okay, the, the new perspectives in Paul from Stendhal, Van Burr, and others, the Jewish tradition still continues the Jewish condition still continues. Yes, the Christian tradition uh, is the fleshing out of God's greater plan for humanity, but within the um, uh, Christian, it has superseded or replaced. And this is what's, of course, given uh, right more purchasing power for many who follow him because he's, he stays very grounded in a very traditional read of Christianity and Judaism. He sees Christ as fulfilling out. Christ is the law, okay, in that sense. The, the, the church is the, it is, it, it is the new Israel in that sense. So unlike people like Sanders and Dunn, who, are, who, who don't hold to that supersessionist replacement theory in quite the same way N.T. Wright does, uh, Wright is going to stand very clearly in, in this line and tradition, and many of his, many of obviously his, both his larger and his smaller books. N.T. Wright is very sympathetic, I might add, when we get to the Jewish-Palestinian position, and in a couple of his books, he's touched on, in fact, the situation of the Palestinians in this, in, in this regards. So within new perspectives of Paul, when it comes to Jewishness, Judaism, Israel, you get Sanders in the one hand, really not, he, he stays in the past, in one sense, the safe academic discussion of the issue of Paul and a revisionist read in terms of the law and grace and why did Paul go in the direction he did. Uh, Dunn is coming out of that a little bit, a certain sympathy to the Palestinians. Wright is much more grounded uh, thoroughly in the biblical tradition, the Christian tradition, taking the possession of uh, supersessionism, a replacement, sensitive, obviously, to the Jewish polite in the Holocaust, but also keenly alert, uh, alert to the justice and peace elements. And this is where you're going to get an NT, right? The kingdom of God is as important as all of this as justification. Remember, Wright came out of an evangelical reform background, and he's moved a long way from that position while not negating the best elements either. He's lived in this tension in a way some people don't want to see him as doing, some want to see him moving in a strong kingdom of God direction. I want to step, just move from the, over to the Jewish tradition briefly here. So when we think of the new perspectives of Paul, um, and as I said, there's the Christian Stendhal, Paul Van Buren, there's the Sanders, Dunn Wright. Uh, now there were people who are grappling with the issue of Paul and the law, Paul and Zionism, Paul and peace, or, or, or Jewishness and propheticism and Zionism, long before Stendhal and um, Van Buren or the other new, and this is Martin Buber. When I was at McMaster, um, as I mentioned earlier, it was the center of Jewish Christian studies and I started my, um, my doctoral studies on Martin Buber. Now Buber, like Stendhal, like Van Buren, like Sanders, like Dunn, like uh, and T. Wright was arguing before them that the Jewish attitudes towards the law was never negative. And when he translates the Hebrew canon or Christian Old Testament, he does not use the German word gazettes, he used the German word weisung, and that law is a guide, it's a pointer, it's a cairn, it's not nothing oppressive, nothing difficult of it. It illuminates the path, it points the way, it is a light under the feet. And so why would we ever see it in a, in a negative way? No more than a hiker in the mountains. We see the trail, would see markings, would see signs, would see um, uh, cairns, would see anukshuks in Canada as pointers. And so first of all, you have in Buber anticipating the new perspectives in Paul with a positive view. 
Uh, secondly, someone like Buber argues that prophetic in Judaism is not about end times. It's not just about Messiah coming and bringing in the new Jews. It's about peace and justice. So the oral, the major and the minor prophets, uh, were much about the Jews being lights and lanterns in terms of justice and peacemaking in the world. And so this understanding of the prophetic and the law for Buber, they come together. The third thing for Buber is Zionism was not uh, understood, in a sense, in the New Jerusalem as a place where the Jews could come and protect themselves from a holocaust or a diaspora again. Zionism was stood, meant to be for uh, Buber. It was the place where the Jews would come to embody what it meant to be agents in justice and peace, and in this case, obviously, with the Palestinians. And so Buber and Judah Magnus were two of the key prophetic figures who understood the relationship of law propheticism and Zionism as a unified outlook for historic Judaism as lived in their particular period of time once Israel had been, been established uh, as a nation in, in, in 48. And so when we think of new perspectives of Paul Martin Buber in a political sense anticipates Stendhal, Man Burren, and he's but he's much more prophetic in the sense he's willing to critique Israel as a Jew. Okay, and unlike, on the other hand, people like Sanders, Dunn, and Wright, which are a little softer on the issue of the Jews and the Palestinians, although being sympathetic to the Palestinians, Buber lived in Israel at the time where he saw what was happening in terms of the Palestinians, and he threaded together the positive view of the law, the prophetic, and Zionism as a means of what Jews were meant to be in the relationship to one another and to the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza itself. So when we think of new perspectives of Paul, what's often ignored is Buber, what's often ignored is Stendhal and Van Buren, and it's often new perspectives of Paul only focuses on the Sanders, the Sanders uh, done right line and lineage, but there's far more to the new perspectives of Paul that must be considered. And so at this point, I think I will wind this down. There's much more I can say, and I'll follow this up perhaps with another overview of, of it in terms of uh, contemporary Jews within Israel at the present time and uh, Christian voices, which are very much articulating uh, a way of understanding this position, which is a more both a Jewish and a Christian prophetic understanding of Israel, Judaism, and Jewishness, but also this one's getting a little longer, so I'll wind it down now, and maybe the next one we'll touch on that.